Okay. So heads I propose to or tails I don't. Order the buckler and shield and prepare for battle. series called Divine Direction. Does that mean? There it is. All right. Well, uh, it's true. Each of our lives are kind of like a book, right? We make thousands of decisions every single day. In fact, I think I've said it before that uh, recent studies have said that there's about 35,000 decisions that you make a day. Wow. That's decision after decision, and each of those decisions just begin to accumulate and form the pages of the story of our life, right? Key thought for this entire series has been that the decisions that we make today determines the stories that we tell tomorrow. The decisions that we make today determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. And when you start making one divine decision after another, you begin to see a different story emerge. You know, speaking of stories, I think we have a story of we need to close a door by crocheting because they're like, that beeping is great. How about this one right over here? Yeah. I love it. Different stories emerge every single day. You just never know. And sometimes you just have to make a choice. And the choice we're going to make right now, we're going to shut that door. Very good. I have too much ADD. I just can't handle it. I'm like, where's the beeping? All right, very good. Let me start back just for a second. Here's our key thought for the series, all right? Our key thought for the series is this, is the decisions that we make today determines the stories that we tell tomorrow. And when you start making one divine decision after another, right, you begin to see a different story emerge. You begin to see a story in your life that God wants to tell through your life. Our text today that we're going to look at takes a bright yellow highlight marker right through it to do exactly that. Somebody who made a choice to allow God to tell an incredible story through her life. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Now, this story that we're going to look at today, um, it opens up and it tells us about this Israelite family that we're introduced to. Now, to be honest, there's really not that much special about this Israelite family that we're introduced to. In fact, we don't have a lot of context for who they are or where they've come from just by the introduction that's given. And what we find is, is that there's a great famine that's going on in the land of Israel, actually more specifically around the city of Bethlehem. And so uh, that city probably rings a bell to some of you and around that city. And so this particular family says, well, we're going to leave and they leave and go to Moab. While in Moab, the father dies. But the two sons meet wives. In fact, we're introduced to those wives, and their names are Ruth and Orpah. And they are some Moabite women. They continue to live in Moab for the next 10 years. And over the course of that time, both of the sons, the husbands, die as well. And finally, Naomi, the matriarch of the family, comes to Ruth and to Orpah and says, I need to just go back to my homeland. She says, you guys need to just stay here. Go back to your families. Go back to your lives that are here. You're both still young enough that somebody will choose to love you and you'll be okay. So both of the women had a choice to make. A choice that would determine the rest of their story. Would they choose to stop or would they choose to stay? Hopefully you found the book of Ruth and we're going to start in chapter 1 in verse 14. And we see Orpah, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth 
clung to her. And Naomi said this, she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth looked at her and said, Do not urge me to leave or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Let's pray. Father, we face tough decisions all the time. And it is a little wonder that with the ever more difficult decisions that we have to face, that really as people that we don't come to you more often because, God, our, our decision-making is so crucial. And God, as we tackle these questions of, should I stop or should I stay? God, more than anything else, I pray that I pray that we would stop ignoring who you are. Stop ignoring the things that you've called us to. And God, that we would stay humble and that we would stay at your feet. God, I pray that we would stay seeking your divine direction in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, this is a question that we face a lot, right? As the, the famous philosophers, The Clash, once said, should I stay or should I go? Right? That's just what I want to know. Should I stay or should I go? You know, some of you in this room, you might even be asking that question in your own life, maybe about your marriage. Should I stay or should I go? Maybe you're asking that about another significant relationship in your life. Should I stay or should I go? Maybe it's about your job. Should I stick this out? You know, it's probably one of the most prayed about questions. God, I just need to hear from you. Should I stop this or should I stick this out? You know, I don't know about you, but I've had times in my life where I have chosen wrongly between these two options. Second church that I served at was an amazing church. It was massive. I think I've talked about it maybe a little bit before, especially in some smaller contexts with some people. It was a mega church by all standards um, and served about 40,000 people a weekend and was doing some incredible things. And I was a three, four, and five-year-old pastor there, right? We had about 1,500 three, four, and five-year-olds across five services, right? And I was actually in charge of over five campuses of three, four, and five-year-olds, and we in total had about 2,500 three, four, and five-year-olds every weekend, and over 300 volunteers. Now, some of you, some of you are shaking your heads right now, and you want to know what in the world would possess anybody to want to work with that many three, four, and five-year-olds. I have the answer for you, right? I don't know. All I can tell you is it's where God called me out at that moment, and so I was being obedient to what he had called me to do, but I still don't know what called me to go work with three, four, and five-year-olds. And as we were there working with them, we started putting in a tremendous amount of hours to pull off the work that it took for all of those things that were going on inside that church. My workload was not 40 hours a week. It was not 50 hours a week. In fact, many weeks it was 60 and 70 hours. And some weeks it even took my wife coming alongside of me in order to get the workload that was going on done. And underneath the immense weight of all of that work, I began to burn out, right? Or as the past, Pastor Caleb says it this way, he says, I began to have B.O., right? And he's like, nobody wants B.O. Nobody wants to be around anybody that has B.O., right? B.O. is bad on all counts and all measures. 
and I began to have it. I was burning out, and my wife knew it, and I knew it. And we began to have conversations about should we stay or should we go? And I remember looking at my wife and saying, no, we're gonna, we're just gonna, uh, this was my Jewish moment, we're gonna squeeze this out for all that it's worth, right? We're gonna, we're gonna learn everything that God possibly has for us here inside of this context. And so we continued to stick it out. Not to tell you that that statement that I made back to my wife about what we were going to do involved zero prayer. Zero prayer from me and zero invitation for her to pray alongside of that decision. And so it probably comes as no surprise that a few months later, I sat in an office across from my boss and was handed my resignation papers. Now, generally, I talk about it as a mutual breakup, right? I was done, they were done, we came to mutual understanding that I was no longer going to work there. It's kind of like that mutual breakup that you have, right, where you're sitting there and really it's somebody else who's dumping you, but you're just trying to make yourself feel a little bit better about the whole situation. That's what was going on. And I can tell you, it hurt tremendously. It hurt because here it was, so much of my self-worth was tied up in all of that work that I was doing with that identity of who that church was and being there and the status that came along with it. And I was like, I'm worthless now. I'm damaged goods. Will anybody else ever want me? Good thing is you guys don't want me and I know that's so why we're okay, okay? All right? But I was like, will anybody else want me? And I began to ask those questions of why? I didn't really ask the question, why did I get fired? But I was asking the question of why? Why, why did I not listen to that still small voice that was saying it was time to go? Why did I not engage with my wife in this conversation about maybe it was time for us to step away? Could I have saved some massive amount of heartache had I been willing to listen and to pray about that situation. You know, I, I've come to understand really why it is that I didn't listen to that word. Because stopping has a negative connotation in our world today, doesn't it? If you stop something, you're just a quitter. You're just a quitter, and nobody, nobody wants to be a quitter. In fact, I think I was always told that we could do anything that we wanted except quit. And I've invested that same kind of principle into my daughter. I'm like, look, we can outwork people. We'll do all kinds of things, and if you don't start something, that's okay. But if we start it, by golly, we're going to finish it because we don't quit. It's a value, it's really an American value, right, about what quitting looks like. Few people want to be labeled as a quitter. You know, I labeled this idea SOS, stop or stay, and um, I went back and was reading the story of the Titanic this week. Now, the Titanic in, in folklore is credited with being one of the first ships to ever use the SOS out there. They're actually not. It was being used before then. Um, but their captain at one point, when nobody was responding, he said, well, heck, he said, we just as well send out that new thing called SOS and just see. He says, this may be our last opportunity to do it. And you know, what's interesting about the story of the Titanic is, is that the Titanic had a chance to stop. Because before the Titanic ever came upon the ice field that was there, they received a message from a ship that has been vilified in history, the Californian, who had stopped in the middle of the ice field. And they'd sent out a message to the Titanic and said, warning, ice ahead, danger, stop. And the Titanic responded and said, 
Please shut up and get off of the airwaves. We're too busy for you right now because their wire operators were too busy sending all the messages from all the people that were on the ship who wanted to say how great everything was that they were on this amazing ship because they had just come into range to send messages into America. And so he had a backlog of all of this. And he's like, I don't have time for you. I'm too busy for this. Please clear out the airwaves for me. And with that, the Californian went silent and they actually went off of the airwaves for the rest of the night because they had come to a complete stop. Of course, we know how the rest of the story goes. The Titanic barreled on in and struck an iceberg. And that, coupled with other things, was enough to sink a ship. And the Californian who stopped actually didn't respond to the distress calls until much later because they had gone to a full stop on everything on their ship. You know, there are times I think that God calls us to stop. There are other times that I think God calls us to stay, and I think that we've all had those moments where we've stayed when we should have stopped, and we've probably stopped when we should have stayed. And I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball at you because you're probably going, well, this story of Ruth is a story of her staying, right? And I really, I don't think so. This story that we just read is a story of Ruth quitting something. You see, Ruth had made a decision that she was going to quit her old life. She made a decision that she would abandon her old ways and she was going to cling to something new. I love this quote. Craig says this in the book. He says, God may call you to abort, abandon, or abolish something. To stop something that helps you to live the story he wants you to tell. Right? God may call you to abort, abandon, or abolish something that helps you to live the story that he wants you to tell. You see, Ruth looked at her life, and she began to play it forward. What would happen in her story if she continued down the same path that she'd always been on? The same path that if she continued to worship the other gods that were part of Moab and that were there in her country? What would happen? Or, or she could stop it. And she could instead pursue the one true God. The God that Naomi was serving. I love Isaiah 116. In fact, it's going to show up in our next series that we're going to preach on. Um, that's how much I love it. But it says this, and I like the NIV version on it because of what it says. It says, take your evil deeds out of my sight. And then it says, stop doing wrong. Stop doing wrong and instead learn to do right and seek justice. I love that. Stop doing wrong. Years ago, Bob Newhart did a skit, right? I love Bob Newhart. He's so funny. But he did a skit that he was a psychologist. And a young lady comes into his practice in order to seek help from Dr. Newhart. And he lays out the ground rules about what's going to happen. He says, look, he says, I think I can help you out. He says, here's how this works. He says, I charge a dollar per minute for the first five minutes. He says, um, and then it's free after that. It doesn't cost anything. And he said, but you also need to know that I don't make change. The young lady says, well, this sounds like an incredible deal. And he says, okay, well, let's begin and she launches in to share what it is that her problem is and she says I'm afraid of being buried alive and Dr. Newhart looks at her and says well has anybody ever tried to bury you alive she says no she says, well that's good that's good she says but it, this fear has so gripped my life that now I cannot go into tunnels 
I cannot go into elevators. In fact, I cannot go into any boxy thing, including homes. And he's like, well, I, I, think, I think I can help it. I think I can help you. And so I want to share with you, I've got the video clip of what Dr. Newhart says to the young lady. I think it's good, and I think you'll enjoy it. So let's check out this video clip. Yes, yes that's it. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. Yes. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. We, we, we don't go there. Just, just stop it. <laughs> So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. Well, it's only been it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Uh, I only have a fun. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's a humorous skit, and partly it's humorous because it's not really that easy, right? If it was that easy, we would, we would just do it that away. You know, in week one. We said when it comes to God's will, what he cares about most is our holiness. He wants us to be holy. And in our pursuit of holiness, there are things that we need to just stop it. There are things that we need to just lay aside. In fact, Hebrews 12.1 says it this way. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight every sin which clings so closely to us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Those things which keep us from being holy, God wants us to stop it. Those things which hinder our pursuit of him, God wants us to stop it. Those sins which cling closely to us, God says, just stop it. And at times, at times, God calls us to stop and just be still. And to know that he is God. And we are to look and to see if we are headed towards him or if we're headed away from him. What is the story that God wants to tell in and through your life? Am I doing something that prevents that story from being told? God says, if you are, stop it. So how do you know when it's time to stop something? How do you know when it's time to stop something? I have two things I want to help you with. I think there's two questions that we should ask to help us know, is this something that I should stop? Here's the first question. Is it an addiction? Is it an addiction? There are lots of things in the world today that people become addicted to. Now we think of the easy things like drugs, alcohol, but there's the new player on the field, pornography, right? There's video games. And most of us walk around with probably the most highly addictive thing every day, our cell phones. 
right? We don't usually think of this, but the first of the Ten Commandments, right? Moses got all ten of the commandments. He was given to share them with the people. And the first one says, put God first. In fact, here's what it literally says in Exodus 23. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. God says, in essence, I want you to be addicted to me and nothing else. I want to be your first. You see, an addiction is just really, it's an acknowledgement that God is not enough in our lives. Let that one sink in for just a second. Is God enough? Because an addiction is just an acknowledgement that he's not. God says, listen, I want to be first in your life. I want your family to be the second thing that you're addicted to. And the third thing is I want my community, my fellow believers, the followers of Jesus Christ to be the third thing that you are all about. And a lot of times, especially us as men, we get confused on this and we think our number one thing is our jobs. And we become workaholics addicted to our jobs because they give us fulfillment and we feel like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. God says, no, that's not the order here. Here's the second thing. First question is, is it an addiction? The second one is, is it a distraction? Is this item an distraction? You know, we have things that get in the way of us living the life that God calls us to live all the time. Sometimes it's our busyness. And it distracts us from doing the things that God wants us to do. Francis Chan, when he speaks, he often tells a story about a young man who quoted this. He said, he said, gangs are more like family and committed than the church is. Now this week, I'm going to put an article up on our Facebook page that's from that young man that is really kind of the rest of the story on this. But here's what happened. This young man had been living in South Central LA and was a part of a gang and a gang was everything. They would drop everything at any moment for anything and he was trying to break free of that life. And he'd walked into a church and he had gotten himself involved in a small group at that church. And the young man was looking for a way out and so he called some of the people in the middle of the night that were in his group and said, hey, I just need some help. And they said, call back at a better hour. He called somebody else another time and said, hey, I just need somebody to go hang out with so that I can put myself in a better place and a better decision and make a better decision in my life. And the person said, I, you know, I'm really too busy for that right now. And so in his frustration, this young man said, my brothers that are a part of the gang are more like a family than what the church is being right now because I'm desperately seeking for that family to come around me and they're not there because why? They're distracted. And I know what my God would say about that. He'd look down on that and he'd say, stop it! Stop letting other things get in the way of what I've called you to be and to do. Me first, your family second, and your community, the Christ followers around you third. It's what I've called you to. That's what I want you to do and to be. Look, Ruth stopped. She looked at the story of her life and she realized and decided that that story, that story was not going to be told in Moab. In fact, right there in verse 14 is the last that we hear of Orpah. She never shows up again. Her story 
ended right here for all intents and purposes. So here's the question. What is it that you are addicted to? What is it that you are distracted by that prevents you from having the story that God wants you to tell? What is it that God is calling you to stop? But God doesn't always call us to stop, does he? No, sometimes, sometimes God calls us to stay. The choice to stay is this. It's the willingness to stick it out even when it might be easier to go. Right? The choice to stay is this. It's the willingness to stick it out even when it might be easier to go. In chapter 2, we find that Naomi and Ruth have made their way back to the town of Bethlehem. And we see that Ruth decides to go out because the harvest is going on and she is going to take on the position of a beggar. In other words, she is going to come behind the reapers who are going to take off the best heads of grain that existed and she's going to take whatever is left, something that hits the ground that she has to pull up, even if it's one seed at a time, whatever it is, that's what she's going to do. And as she's gathering following behind, she catches the eyes of a man named Boaz. Read with me, starting in verse 14. Then Boaz said to Ruth, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have come to take refuge. I love this part of the story. I love it because Boaz tells her in the middle of this, I have heard the story of what God is doing in your life right the story that god is writing it captures not only his ears it captures his eyes and it captures his heart it's a powerful story that god is writing in ruth's life and boaz then invites ruth to stay he says, I want you to stay in this field that I have. He says, I want you to come up to the front and instead of gathering in the back, he says, I want you to gather in the front where, where my women, the women that are underneath my protection gather. He says, I want you to move from the, the least of the least to a, a little bit better position and standing. It didn't make life a whole lot easier, but it was a little bit easier. And he said to her, when you get thirsty, the same place that my men get water from, you can go get water from. And I've already instructed everybody to leave you alone. And so for the rest of the harvest, she chooses to stay. She chooses to stay in this particular field underneath this protection, and she's there through both harvests that come up, the barley and the wheat harvests that come. She does both of them. And she harvests it. You see, when we are faced with the decision about whether or not we should stop or stay, if what we are doing is not an addiction, if it's not a distraction, then we should probably be asking God if we are desperately praying to him to release us, but he hasn't, then we need to stay. I love this quote. Craig talks about it in a story about when he thinks he's about to get fired from the church that he's at. And he's, the guy that he's with, his mentor, says, here's something you can be certain of. He says, the more God wants to use you, the more likely you will be tempted to quit. The more God wants to use you, the more likely you'll be tempted to quit. 
The scripture doesn't tell us that Ruth was tempted to quit at any point doing this. But let me tell you, it wasn't going to be easy for her. It wasn't easy for her in the moments that came after this conversation with Boaz. In fact, after they go through the harvest, Naomi comes up with a plan and says, Ruth, I want to get you married so that you can be taken care of. She says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Boaz and sit at the threshing floor at his feet. And I want you to offer yourself to him and ask him to be your redeemer, the one who redeems you. And so Ruth goes and does all of that. And she's like, pseudo rejected. He's like, this is really nice, but what you do, we can't really let anybody know what you've done. Um, and so when you quietly sneak out of here, I'm going to give you some grain so that nobody will know because there's some other things that still have to take place here. And she walks away and she goes back and tells Naomi about what happened. And Naomi in verse 18 of chapter 3 says this. She says, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. Now, I should probably apologize for using such a really bad four-letter word. I don't know anybody who likes the word wait. It is an awful, awful word because we are anything but a patient people, right? We hate to wait. In fact, I jokingly say to people, if I don't like somebody, I'm going to pray patience over you. I'm going to pray patience for you, right? That's like the nail, the, the coffin in the nail, the nail in the coffin for somebody. Because I promise you, God answers that prayer. Right? If you want to get a nasty prayer going for yourself, just say, God, I need some more patience. Will you please give it to me? I think he always answers that one. Because we are not good at waiting. We are not patient people. In fact, the old motto says, it says, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And a lot of times what I think we think that means is that when it gets tough around me, it's time for me to get out of Dodge. And that's not what God says. He says, listen, if I haven't called you to stop this, I am calling you to stay. And if you're tempted to walk away from whatever situation you're in, if you're tempted to walk away, you need to make sure to seek God. Because you never know what God might do if you have the courage to stay. Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story, right? So Boaz comes back to Ruth, and they get married. And the elders of the city speak this blessing over them that is absolutely incredible, and it's fairly cryptic. I had to go searching this week to find out about the story of the house of Perez, and I'm not going to answer the question for you because we're running out of time. But they pray this blessing over Ruth and Boaz that is a blessing that includes them into the line of kings. In fact, Ruth becomes the great, great grandmother of a guy named David. Perhaps the greatest king that Israel ever had inside of their kings. And if you're not sure, play that on forward. Ruth becomes the, like, 14th generation great of a guy named Jesus. In fact, she's one of three women who are named in the book of Matthew as part of the line, the messianic line that existed. It's Ruth, Rahab, and Tamar. And by the way, Tamar is part of that house of Perez in that story. What an incredible blessing that was getting, that was given to Ruth. And why was it given to her? Because she chose to stop when God called her to stop. And she chose to stay when God didn't tell her to stop. Because of that, God wrote an incredible story in her life. What story does God want to write in your life? What story does God want to write 
through your life? What do you need to stop? And where do you need to stay? Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for a story like Ruth. A story that we can see what it is that you did so that we can know because you are a faithful God that you can do the same kind of things in our own lives. That you've always been in the business of writing huge God-sized stories. And God, so often we get distracted because the devil is in the details. And he brings our eyes down. And we don't ask the big questions. Should I stop this? Or should I stay this? And I pray that, that this week, as we're evaluating our lives and the stories that you're writing in our lives, God, that we would look at that and we go, God, what do you want us to stop? God, where do you want us to stay? You know, one of the biggest uses of the word stop inside of this is the Bible is this idea of repent, to stop and turn around and go the other way. Ruth made a decision to stop being in charge of her own life and to leave behind the other gods that she worshiped. For some of you, the thing that God may be calling you to stop is to stop being in charge of your own life. Turn it over to him. To repent from the sins that you carry and all of that weight and the attempt that you have to think that you can be righteous on your own. Listen, the Bible tells us none is righteous, no, not one. Nobody is in right standing with God. Jesus says, if you'll turn to me, I'll take care of that. Maybe you're here and you've never stopped like that. I want to invite you today to be the day that you stop. At the end of the service, I'll be in the back. If that's you, you say, you know what, Pastor Charles, I need to stop. I need to stop being in charge of my own life and let Jesus be in charge of my life. Can you help me do that? I'd be more than happy to help you to make that decision to stop. Father, I just give you all of the glory and all of the honor. It's in your name we pray.